Oh. Hey, Alice. Oh. Hey, we're getting ready to start. We are. We're on. Yeah, well, we're fixing to. Yep. Welcome to the File Play. To welcome to the File Play YouTube channel. We are locked. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 22 of the Crime Theory Exchange. After a few months of hiatus, um, we are back, and I just want to say hello to everyone on the panel and hello to everyone in chat. How are you today, Jack? Oh, I'm just Jim Dandy, you know, just waiting for, um, well, it's cold here. Well, it's not cold today, but it's going to be rain and, you know, fall weather. I love it, actually. I, I love this time of year because it's a transition course. Going and ending this yeah. year and going into the next. So I, I just, I love fall weather. Today's not too bad, though. I think it's mid-60s today, but not going to be like that after today. <laughs> anyway, doing pretty yeah. good. Hope that intro it's coming yeah we got rain and i think it's going to be high tomorrow like 50 or something lows in the 30s uh, um, and alice how are you today hi christina nice to see you back with us and doing crime theory again um bloody freezing that's what it's like here um a dramatic change in the weather that we've had we had rain all day the other day there and the temperatures dropped quite a bit so it's bloody freezing <laughs> yeah yeah i see whenever y'all talk about it i always feel guilty because like here in florida i think it's like 85 right now um there is a slight chance of rain but um it's you know we we really we have we have summer and then we have winter for like a month and then that's about it florida's weird for sure um i want to say hey to everyone in the chat hi dark Psy, jazz naz angie pj kelly mcgallan's here um and uh i thank everyone for coming so today's topic is kind of like I just want to, I think we've all got this idea of the criminal justice system and the prison system in our heads um, from TV and just from what we've been taught in schools. And I think that it would be really helpful if we look at a history of the criminal justice and prison industry and the history of the wrongful convictions, um, you know, through one of the things that, that we try to, to highlight is the changes that need to be made in order to stop these wrongful convictions. And um, I can't, I, I refuse to believe that prior to making a murderer, there weren't people trying to fix this. Right. We can't be the only people that are disgusted by wrongful convictions um, throughout the history of the prison system. And so I thought it would be interesting to kind of look at a brief overview of the prison system, criminal justice system, look at the money involved and also um, take a look at a history of wrongful convictions. And then I stumbled upon a 2020 a study that was put out by the University of Michigan on wrongful convictions. That's quite interesting. And so we're going to discuss that. Um, I also uh, want to take a minute to say, I think just Rhonda's going to try and join us later. Um, and I think she's really going to be interested in the study because it mentions Joyce G Gilchrist and Jax can talk a little bit about that and how, um, you know, she's part of the uh, the Oklahoma 
garbage DA's office and all those wrongful convictions. And also for Alice, there is, a, I didn't know, but there is a photo. I don't know if Jax can put it on the screen. There in Europe, as early as the 1790s, they had prison ships where they would hold prisoners on a ship. Um, and yep, it was quite, actually, it was quite, it was, it was quite common back. Yeah, and they actually had what they called debtors. I don't, I've never said that word right, but debtors prisons. So if someone said you didn't pay them, they would put you in prison for that. And that wasn't outlawed until like the 1840s, I believe. Um, so they would like someone could say you didn't pay them for something they did and you would go to prison for it. And uh, I, I thought that was kind of uh, quite cruel. To be and, and no one, no, you know, on, on the subject, uh, no one should ever think that the prison system isn't a business. <laughs> it is. It's a huge, oh. huge business. Billions yeah. of dollars. Can you put up that key statistic? I think it's in if you're the if first. you're if you're if you're ready for the slides, I can start from whenever you're. Yeah, yeah. Let's start the slides. Let me see which one first again. Okay, it's gonna pop in. There. Okay. Yeah. So here, I think this was in two thousand and twelve. Uh, the government spends $80 billion on state and federal funded prisons. Um, and that additional $4 billion, almost $4 billion on private prisons and jails. And I, I, whenever I see 1980, I think of Jackson, Ronald Reagan, and the War on Drugs campaign. Um, in the last 40 years, the, the cost spent on the prisons industry has gone up 300%. Now, what's interesting about the number of companies that profit from mass incarceration, the owner of the Detroit Pistons has just purchase JPay, Securus, and I think three or four other prison services and lump them in to his company. So he profits his Tom Gores, who owns the Detroit Pistons, he is has a uh, a net worth of over thirty six billion dollars. Um, is the person who profits off of prisoners' families, sharing money with them, going, paying to email them, paying to see them, paying to speak to them on the phone. So uh, it's definitely, I think it's clear that people have, you know, made a lot of money on on prisoners and. Uh -huh. I had no idea really until making a murder and we got into the phone calls and all that, how much of a rip off that whole Evercom and there's other ones too, how much they charge mm -hmm. per minute. It's, it's criminal. It, it really oh. should be criminal. Mm -hmm. And now I don't know how many states have done it since Wisconsin. With Wisconsin, you can't even write a prisoner. Now you have to write a third party. So I'm sure yep. they're profiting off of that. Of course. Um, if you send, yep. If you send an email, um, I know the last time I sent an email to someone in prison, I think it was like fifty cent an email, um, and they pay fifty cent to email me back. Um, phone calls. The phone calls have gone down in price. Uh, I yep. remember years ago it used to be, I think. Like if you were in a different location, it could be up to thirty dollars a call. Could you imagine trying to budget one phone call a week from a from a loved one? 
you know, when you're working for minimum wage. I mean, that's basically half your paycheck. Just hell, hell, if, you, if, you, if, if you're if, if you're working, even if you're making above minimum wage, you're making somewhat of a decent wage. It's still um, prohibitive. They don't want you talking. They would they would no. keep them separated and beaten. Yeah, it's it's disgusting. It really is. Goes right and, back uh, to the thirteenth. Goes right to the thirteenth amendment. Period. Yeah, yeah, um, and so. I just I, I think we need to um, be aware that there is a lot of money at stake here with ending mass incarceration and um, starting to really get a handle on on the wrongful conviction numbers. Um, one of the stats that I came across that that really um, kind of confirmed what I was thinking. Um, was, you know, when you, if you Google how many people are wrongfully convicted uh, in America, it usually says between three and 5%. But there's a University of Virginia study um, that says that um, in their, in their study, it was 12%. So, um, and I think that that number is probably even a little on the low side because you're not counting people who for whatever reason plead guilty just to be done with it you know um that's plea like deals Jeff, Ple- yeah plea I, deals mm-hmm. and uh if you're innocent and you plead guilty because the da's office and the cops have set you up in my mind you're still wrongfully convicted look at nicole Bacchus. you know she pled guilty just to be done with it but we have clear evidence that she wasn't driving her vehicle that night and uh you know and they used the media the cops lied um they coerced such, witnesses it's such a hosed up case it's so bad it's so yeah rough. it is it is and um so um and then Melissa Lucio, same thing with her. You know, she she didn't plead, but she's innocent. And speaking of the two ladies, um, I found a photo of the first women's prison. Uh, is that? I think that might be the next slide. No, Mount it's Pleasant. no. It's this dude here. That this is the one you're talking about. You just you oh, need yeah. to tell me when you, when you want me to go to the next slide. You just tell me. And I'll thumb. okay. So this is the guy who has become, I don't know if he became a billionaire off of prison phone calls, but he's definitely making billions off of prisoners' phone calls. His name is Tom Gores. He also owns the Detroit Pistons. And he's uh, also, and I say this with sarcasm, he has put a lot of money into quote, fixing Detroit's water system. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you I'm glad you see that as well. Well, um, I'm you gotta remember i uh not long after we moved here was the whole Flint water scandal and, and what they did. The people really should be in jail over that serious jail mm-hmm. time. I agree. I agree. Um and if we go to the next slide think that's going to be oh there's see alice that is the british convict ship the success it, could you imagine being a prisoner on a ship in 1790 no no that's not that I mean, doesn't it surprise me at all um having having a ship you know what I mean, as a prison. Um, back then, I think they would have used anything and everything. They used the Tower of London and everything like that as a prison and that as well, you know what I mean? So um, it doesn't surprise me that back then they would have used a ship as well to keep away the riffraff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, um, can, they, can do, they can, you know, if there were trouble, they could just, you know, take the boat out to the middle of whatever and say, where are you going to go? Good luck. Yeah, I was thinking about all the the illnesses and 
<clears throat> excuse me, unsanitary conditions and uh, just yeah, how cold it must have been and dark and and just really uh, what a dismal place to have to uh, serve time for sure. Um, and then I think the next slide. This is the first documented. Oh no. So this is the first penitentiary that was, this is, this was a jail and it was the first federal penitentiary. Um, they went ahead and allocated government funding for it because it was overcrowded, excuse me, overcrowded. And that was also in 1790. Um, and it was in Philadelphia. And then I think maybe the next one. The women's prison, the first one. Yeah. Like, yeah, Mount Pleasant. What a hell of a, mm -hmm. what a hell of a name for a prison. Mount Pleasant. Are you kidding? Yeah. And um, I did a little bit of research on this. This prison closed in less than 30 years amid allegations of uh, women being straightjacketed, women being gagged, women being um, physically and sexually abuse and does, um, just that, that inhumane. It does not surprise me one bit. Yeah. I'm surprised it yeah. lasted. Yeah. So it didn't. It don't. It didn't even make it 30 years before they closed it. Do, do, do you remember finding out what year they opened it, or or no? I think it was in 18. I want to say they opened in 1830 and they closed in 1860. It was around oh. that time. Um, just a quick, Maz in chat was asking what was the the UK price for uh, prisoner phone calls. Um, what I came across, uh, Maz, is currently prisoners using pay phones pay around 8.4 pence per minute to call a landline and 18.4 pence to call a mobile. Oh my God! Why would it, it's over double the price just to call a mobile phone? What? That's crazy. Mm -hmm. now is yeah. a pen equal to a penny? Mm -hmm. It's not an exact, no. not an exact uh, crossover. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, how many pence? How many pence in a pound? <laughs> I have Susan. no idea. Hey. Hi, Susan. Hi. I'm late. Hundred pounds yeah. in a pound. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, okay. so, it, it, and a pound is a little is like a dollar and whatever the whatever the uh, conversion yeah, is. A dollar and ten cents. A dollar and ten cents is what you're getting for a pound the now yeah. because our pound just went down the drain. Um, yeah. But, yeah, you, you get, a, a, in your money, you get a dollar ten cents for every pound. Right. So, so it's a little less than. So basically eight cents. So you get ten, roughly six minutes for a dollar. It's way cheaper is what it is. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, way the hell cheaper. Way At least cheaper. From the time they, that Brendan and offers. Stephen were in. Yeah, they've got offers um, using virtual landline for prison calls. A virtual landline offers an unlimited prison phone call service for only £3.95 per month. Here's how it works. A friend or family member in prison calls you, calls your dedicated virtual landline number. They speak to you via the app on your mobile phone, paying a low call rate for calls to you. Many family members send money into prison to add to the inmates' call credit. Using our app increases their talk time and makes your money go further. The yeah, virtual that's landline not, that, that's not a bad deal, Rad. Yeah, that's yeah. not bad. That's how it should all. be here. We're just so yeah. prison's profit that 
Presnor's required to cover the cost of their calls from their private cash or earnings. We will give you a landline number which, when called, rings on your mobile, then inmate calls your virtual line number, and because it's a landline number, the BT, BT payphone inside will only charge as little as six pence per minute off peak. So, so that's pretty good. So here's a funny story. Um, when you, so if you call long distance, if you're in jail in Florida and you call a long distance number, it costs more money, right? So we got smart and uh, started, you know how you could pick the area code for your cell phone? <laughs> We not here. Pick, not here. Not here. You. Well, you can in Florida. You can pick the area code. You can pick the area code for your cell huh. phone, especially if it's a prepaid cell phone. So we would pick. We would go and buy one of those. Uh, uh, I shouldn't be saying this on on the air in case people are still doing it. But the, you know, like a track phone yeah. is like a, a throwaway phone. We'd go buy a track phone SIM card. Pick the area code that we wanted our number to be generated from and then use that number and then call forward it to our number and it would save like $15 a call. Yeah. Wow. Because it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous what they wanted to charge. I remember at one time I had like three phones because you're only allowed to do, you can't, and it, more than one inmate can't call a phone number either. And a lot of the jails here. So, like, if you had a nephew in one jail and a brother in another, you had to have two phones <laughs> so that they could call you. Pretty funny. Anyway. And no, I don't hang out with criminals. They were just young and dumb, you know? I wasn't going to say anything. I, I, I know. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, I don't, speaking, of, speaking of this and phone calls and maybe somebody... In chat or somebody here knows, I know that Brendan has a tablet, and I, I you know, because he's in a medium security now, and mm -hmm. you you can text him, but I, I know that I think there's some kind of charge surrounding that. Does anybody know what how much that is? No. Yeah. What's that, Jeff? I'm sorry. Brendan has a tablet that he can get email with certain oh, privileges yeah. since he's in a medium security now. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly the the amount of it, um, but he can get the email uh, system thing um, on his tablet, definitely. But I couldn't say for certain how much it is. Yeah, I, I know a few people that talk to him, and I, I've never inquired. But, you know, it, it and I'm sure, you know, he, he has money filtering him you know to his account but you know, this is a thought you know because it's his connection to the outside world whether it's his mom or you know a few friends that he may talk to that at some point maybe we could help him out a little bit it's just yeah um i'm sure mass said becca would probably know and i'm sh and she probably would but i wouldn't mind being able to reach out to him um you know, just especially, I think his birthday's coming up, or has it passed yet? Isn't his birthday right around now? Yeah, the 19th. Yeah. Yeah, his, his birthday's coming up. It's the 19th. So, yeah. It, um, a catnip said the same thing. Um, so, so I Googled uh, what was the first recognized wrongful conviction um kind of get back on there and uh if you'll go to the next slide this case is absolutely insane i probably got it on um, the wrong slide i'm not sure which one you want it should be like a picture of a guy holding a stick let's see let me see what number it is on your Center, center on wrongful center on wrongful convictions. Uh, it's like it was in that slide.
preview you sent me, it was number three. But Yeah, but I, I changed all that. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, what, go to the, whichever one you got next, and we'll discuss it. It's all right. Well, there's a guy here holding a stick and with a photo with yeah, him. Yeah, that's and he's the got one. A, yeah, that's yeah, one. That's it. First wrongful mm -hmm. conviction. Um, looks like an article. Yeah. So, so we I'm were there in 1912. Suspicion of foul play. Yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so I'm going to kind of read this or actually, Susan, can you read it? Because your voice is so <clears throat> much better. Uh, let me see. This is a crazy story. Bigger. Do I need, do I need to blow this up bigger? I can see it, Jeff. Mm -hmm, I can. First wrongful conviction, Jesse Bourne and Stephen Bourne, two of them. Mm -hmm. When Russell Colvin disappeared from Manchester, Vermont in 1812, suspicion of foul play understandably fell upon his brother-in-law, Jess, brother-in-law, brothers-in-law, Jesse and Stephen Bourne, who had worked with him on their father's farm. The Bourne brothers had made no secret of their disdain for their sister's spouse. In fact, they had complained often that Calvin, a habitue of the local public house, was sloughing off on the job and freeloading off the family. Despite the widespread suspicion that the Bournes had slain Colvin, nothing happened in the case until seven years later, when Amos Bourne, an uncle of the suspects, claimed that Colvin had appeared at his bedside during a recurring dream. The ghost confirmed, just as he had just has had just as had been widely assumed, that he had been slain. He did not identify his killers, but did say that his remains had been put in an old cellar hole in a potato field on the Bourne farm. In light of the dream, the cellar hole was excavated. In it were found pieces of broken crockery, a button, a pen knife, and a jackknife, but no human remains. Russell Colvin's wife, Sally Bourne Colvin, sister of the suspects, promptly identified the items as having been her husband's. However, she had a motive to say that whether true or not. It was in her interest to have Russell proven dead because <clears throat> more than a gestation period after his disappearance, <laughs> she had given birth to a child. Because the law presumed a child born to a married woman to have been fathered by her lawful husband, Sally was ineligible for support from the child's actual father. For her to collect, Russell needed to be dead. Moreover, Sally may not have realized when she identified the items that furthering her interest in collecting support would be so potentially detrimental to her brother's interest in remaining alive and free. Wow. Mm -hmm. So if you, uh, let me see. I, didn't, I forgot that it was this long. So basically, they're both convicted they're found guilty i think they they were sentenced to death and so she so she could collect support right now listen to this the journalistic event that turned the tide for the born brothers was an item in the new york evening post november 26 1819 marveling that divine intervention had brought Colvin's killers to justice. The item was read aloud in the lobby of a New York hotel when a traveler from New Jersey, Caber Chadwick, happened to be staying. Chadwick knew a man who went by the name Russell Colvin, who often had spoken of Vermont and who had been employed for the last several years as a farmhand in Dover, New Jersey. Chadwick immediately dispatched two letters relating to the foregoing, one, one to the post, the other to the Manchester postmaster. 
The letters described him, Colvin, as a man of rather small stature, round forehead, who speaks very fast, has two scars on his head, and appears to be between 30 and 40 years of age. The letter to the Manchester Post had no effect. Perhaps the telling commentary on the quality of the defense that the Bournes received for the postmaster who received the letter was none other than their junior trial counsel, Leonard Sargent. The Post, however, published the letter. In yet another serendipitous turn of events, the letter was read by one James Welfley, a native of Manchester and now living in New York. Welfley immediately left for Dover, where he found a living breathing but uncooperative Colvin who refused <laughs> to return to the Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah. So anyway, they end up getting exonerated, thankfully. But like I it just goes to show it's the it's I find it interesting that the same for me, I mean do y'all find it interesting as well? It's the same stuff, right? Like, no, no remains, um, no forensic evidence. The witness had a reason to say, "Yeah, that's my husband's stuff." Yep, absolutely. So I just thought that was, you know, same thing, different of, time period, using yeah. different, yeah. You know. Pieces of evidence, but she had a uh, she had an ulterior motive. Yeah, two hundred years later, we're still dealing with the same stuff. Yeah. Now, um, let's see, and then, um, excuse me. So, I just want to kind of, if you'll pull up the starred, um. PDF that I sent you. It was number four. Um, and it's got red stars on it. So this study that we're going to discuss is was done by the University of Michigan in 2020. I thought that and, was a website you sent website you sent me to. Well, I did send you a link to the site as well, but I thought that was just a PDF or a screenshot I made. Um, it. Um, Let's see. What's interesting, well, the entire thing is interesting. I got to quit saying that. Um, I just, I, I think that it's almost like there's a playbook on how wrongful convictions are done. Um, you know, like prosecutors and attorneys are taught, you know, criminal legal process. Police officers are taught how to be good cops. But I also feel like for, yes, we have that, but I think we also have rule books and playbooks for how to be, how to convict people wrongfully and how to be a bad cop because you keep seeing the same things over and over and over. Um, I think it's called tunnel vision. Yeah, well, and that's part of it. I think it's it just, also... Yeah. No, go ahead, Susan. I'm sorry. I was just going to say they just uh, get in their mind it's a certain person, you know, and just uh, stick with that. And it they're being lazy. You know, um, they think they've got somebody they can railroad. They just go for it. Yeah, that's I, that definitely happens, too. They would rather close the case instead of um, making yeah. sure they're solving the case. Right. They close equals solve, whether it's the right guy or the wrong guy. Um, if you can't find um, that PDF, Jax, if you can just pull up the University of Michigan study. We can talk about that. Um, uh, yeah, no, this says because their conviction rates depend on it. And, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that these people are elected and they do this shit, you know, to have a good record, 
it's just wrong. Yeah. And and they receive bonuses. It's just like with the DCF system. Um, that's so that, sorry, Christina. That's what I was just going to say. The thing is, is the thing that's wrong with these people is the fact that they've been getting away with this for so many years. So they think they can do it whenever they want. You know what I mean? This is where the prosecutor immunity needs to come in, and it needs to stand for something. Because if they were getting punished instead of getting rewards and moved up for, for, for sergeant to chief or, or whatever, you know what I mean? Then maybe they think twice about setting up poor people. Because if you've got the money, you can get your fancy lawyers, you can pay your $500,000 bail or whatever. But somebody like Stephen and Brendan and Luke and stuff like that who are in low-income families or middle-class families that can't afford to pay $500,000 bail, so they're having to sit in there and practically rot. And I mean, it's not just them, but the majority of people that are in the prisons, their bails are set so high, it is unbelievable. And they know that these people can't afford that, so they can just fling them in jail whenever they, whenever they want and for how long they want, you know what I mean? The prosecutor immunity needs to go um, because it's been inbred for decades now and they've got away with it for decades now. And thanks to making a murderer, I mean, it shouldn't have trained something like that for it to be brought to the forefront, but it has. And it's opening people's eyes up to say, see him that cops are dirty bastards. Prosecutors are dirty bastards, you know what I mean? Judges can be dirty bastards because they've got evidence right in front of them that says this man's DNA was nowhere near the scene, but this man's DNA or that was, but yet they still keep them in jail, you know what I mean? The whole system needs to have an overhaul. Well, the unindicted co-conspirator, absolutely. Hey, uh, Christina, the one that, uh, I've got one here, it's... Um, Trends.vera.org. It's Milwaukee County, Wisconsin. Incarcer incarceration trends. Is that what you want? I don't. Um. Now here, I, I, this is. I, I'm gonna send it to you again. Uh, this is the one. It's the University of Michigan one. Let me see. Let me see if you can get it. To yeah, if you if you just DM it to me or whatever. Yeah, I just sent it to you. Yeah, you hadn't. I don't think you sent me that one. I may have thought I sent it like I did with uh Yeah, I don't Carol. have this one. Yeah, hold on. I can yeah. pull this up. I can pull this up. Give me just um this is so this was a study done in 2020 by um the University of Michigan and the National Registry of Exonerations which um that if you are if you want to find out some if you're ever looking for statistics the national registry of exonerations has a great database to help you search they try and keep it updated on every exoneration um this was the most recent study i could find as far as um encompassing the whole of america um and then I noticed something on here. I just want to mention this. Have y'all seen the new documentary coming out regarding the $80 million raised during the Black Lives Matter campaign that has gone for everything but improving, improving the lives of Black people? <laughs> it's, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah. Um, I've, had, I, I've, I've heard some controversy around that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm. I can't wait to see who profited and um and how they claimed like they they supposedly went to use this money to help like where some of the riots occurred. You know, because a lot of the store owners were people of color. And so that was like one of the platforms they used to raise money. This is to help, you know, to repair the community's damage during the riots. 
the places look worse than they did before they started using them to raise money. Um, and it, yeah, it's just sickening. So, and what made Do you know what the of, name of that is? Um, on, I saved the video. Um, there was like a little thing on TikTok. I saved it. Let me see if I can find it. Um, I think Candace Owens is the woman's name who did the documentary. Yeah, um, Nosy says Kanye West is big into exposing it and Candace Owens. Yeah. Um, and I just, I really think we're going to be surprised to see um, when, I don't think it's out yet, but when it comes out, I think it's really going to be interesting. Yeah, I'm not seeing it yet. This is a um, side I'll note. I will tell I, I, I will tell you one documentary that I did watch. This is completely off topic and we don't have to discuss it. And it I haven't finished it yet. I gotta go back, but I've been busy. Is that Dahmer series on Netflix? That is creepy as hell. Yeah. My mm. husband has been on in on that. Um been watching that. I've been kind of watching it with him a little bit. Um <sighs> I'm going to try and do a study because Jeffrey, I, what I find interesting is if one, one of the most, one of the things that the Jeffrey Dahmer case exposed was how shitty Wisconsin police were, right? Because his neighbor called 911 something like 30 times, right, Jax? Uh, I don't know. It was a lot. You know, the, the well, I mean, there are a number of reasons that I thought of it you, when you talked about that, you know, and seeing this documentary. That's one of the last ones I even I started watching. I've not finished it. But in um, going through, as many people know, uh, I got a bunch of jail visit recordings from basically uh, January through there's one in June of Avery and the various people that. Basically, it's Dolores, uh, uh, Jody, and the preacher comes one time, and I think uh, Alan was there a couple of times. And um, but nonetheless, at various points in the conversation, Dahmer's name comes up. They're talking about really in what, in what yeah. context? The Dahmer case, or this Dahmer Dahmer guy? I, I'm okay. not kidding. It's in there. Uh, at least three times I can think of off the top of my head. What, um, like, but why did, why did the name come up? Because of the way. You know, I don't remember the context around how they were discussed, but they, it would just come up, you know, about the Dahmer case or, or something, you know, uh, talking about, you know, um, him being, you know, locked away on bail that he couldn't afford. I don't know, some context to that. And it just got mentioned two or three times. I remember it directly, distinctly. Because these calls, I have to convert, but I have to listen to the call and record it. It's so ridiculous. I have to listen to it and record it. So as I'm listening, and I'm, of course, I'm doing other things while it's recording, but I still, you know, have an ear to it. So, yeah, it, it's just... But that case is, is, as you said, it, it's such a screwed up case for Wisconsin. Yeah. It, oh, I mean, I think probably his last four or five victims shouldn't have been victims, if not more than that. Right. Um, so the Candace Owens documentary actually uh, um, looks like it debuts today. That's interesting. Um, and there's already articles out calling her a con, a con artist. Oh. I found that interesting. So this study, if we can go to, um, it's page nine on our like nine of two eighteen. I always, I'm always confused if I should say the page on the document or the page that it shows. PDF, PDF, PDF page is easier. I can, I can get there quickly. So this is the, this is page nine of two eighteen. Okay. The executive. And it, 
Yeah. So it just discusses, um, you know, it's there's a dearth of prior systematic research on police misconduct that contributes to false convictions. Um, it's talking about the National Registry of Exonerations. It's an ever-changing public archive. Um, yeah, I like that one up there. Is, that, 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 that one right above, the prosecutorial misconduct has attracted a good deal of attention in the past decade, primarily concealing exculpatory evidence. No. Yeah, right. <laughs> they wouldn't do that. No. What They're the, good guys. What the freak, man. Mm -hmm. Very few were disciplined for it. Mm -hmm. And that's the real, oh. that, that's the real, that's the real carrot and stick there is that there, there is no, uh, th there's no punishment. So why not? Why not cheat the system to get their way? Get their, yeah. yeah. Right. They can go on to be sheriffs or get raised from a deputy to sergeant or, you know, end up becoming the chief. You know, I mean, it is ridiculous. And the, yeah, and the and driver, when, the driver is money and power. Yeah. And when they get called out for it, it's a, a, well, you know, sort of attitude that they have. It wasn't the men. Bullshit, it wasn't the men. You know what I mean? And or they'll just, lie, yeah, or, lie, or, lie, or, lie, and they'll lie, retire, lie. The, the, and they, they'll, they're able to retire without punishment. Oh, well, I'll just retire and take their 30 freaking with, years and walk. With big pensions. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. If they get it's, caught for misconduct, they should, yeah, they should be struck off. If it's a prosecutor or anything like that, even a judge, they should be struck off. Their pension should be taken away from them. Any bonuses that they used to get should get taken away from them. The company car should get taken away from them. Everything. Make them lose everything that they're making these people that they're wrongfully convicting lose because they lose friends, they lose family, they lose their livelihoods. You know what I mean? And these assholes get away with doing it time after time after time after time. And what do we keep hearing every time somebody gets exonerated? It's, oh, it needs to be looked into. Oh, something needs to be done about it. Oh, this. Oh, that, but nothing ever gets friggin' done about it. And it's these prisoners that I feel sorry for who are spending 23 to 27 years or whatever in jail for something that they didn't fucking do. If they get out at all. I mean, exactly. I think, yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're pretty, I think all of us have resolved that Stephen Avery may die in prison, you know? And I think that the fact that we have to accept that is absolutely disgusting. That, that we, we are preparing ourselves for the eventuality that Stephen may die in, in prison, an innocent man, and that people in Wisconsin will probably, and this disgusts me, will probably celebrate when he dies. And to think that I'm sure they that could occur yeah and that's just that that's to me that is just truly heartbreaking paul's got a good One comment that, paul, paul, paul ward says wonder how many times colburn lincoln fassbender and Weiger would need to search Dahmer's house before they would find anything suspicious <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one that is. Um, I was wondering, do you think that the fact that most police are unionized have a lot to do with the fact that um, there's very little, if any, punishment when caught? Is it just easier to slap I think that's them part on the of wrist? Because, of, you know, the, the police unions are powerful. And, you know, I'm going to say this, and you guys can throw darts at me, what, whatever, blow up a big picture of Jack and just, you know, throw a, a hatchet. I'm going to tell you that there has to be that line. Of, there has to be a line of protection for our police officers, the good ones. There has to be. And I don't have a problem with it. What I do have a problem with, though, is when one is caught red-handed doing something wrong, they're still protected. I'm, 
that has to stop. That's the difference, okay. right? And but yeah, I do I do think what you said is correct because the police unions are very powerful. No. Um, I also came across something that I thought was interesting. And it's that up to 80% of the calls that police officers respond to, they don't need to respond to. A lot of them are mental health. Um, you know, there are calls that could be handled without them being involved. Um, you know, even some of your child parent domestic violence issues, having cops come escalates. It doesn't de-escalate situations, you know? And uh, there has been discussion about trying to filter them out, filter calls down different avenues. So maybe cops wouldn't feel so overworked um, and, and they would be able to concentrate more on the on calls where they are needed. You know, even some police or some car accidents could be handled. Like we have what's called field service technicians. Um, they work for the sheriff's department, but they respond to minor traffic accidents instead of having the cops come. I think that's a great um, idea. Yeah. And I think that could help, you know, remo remove some of the burden from them. And I agree, there does need to be some sort of, I don't even, I, you know, I have such a, I have such a bad experience with police officers. Um, I would be fine never interacting with one again, to be honest. Um, yeah, I I've had really both. I've, 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 had, good. I've, had, I've had both sides of it. I haven't had like any really terrible, me personally direct. I've, I've had family members that have, but me personally, mm -hmm. I've, I've had some that were like, you know, pretty crappy, but um, for the most part, my experiences have been okay. Not great, but okay. Yeah. Um, one thing I, one thing I did want in Glasgow, I mean, it was, you never trusted the police. You, you just mm -hmm. didn't. Um, because um, sometimes they would take young lads up an alley or run a back and batter hell out of them, you know what I mean? And and they'd get away with it um, and stuff like that. So if if we seen a robbery or something like that happening, it was always, you never saw nothing, you don't know anything, you know what I mean? Don't say nothing, you don't know nothing, i never seen anything type thing. But that was just how it was back then, you know what I mean? But the the fact is, is that the reason why so much of this is happening is because the cops were getting away with it for so long. But now that you've got the magical thing in mobile phones with cameras on them, they're pissed off because their bad behaviour is being caught on film and they don't like it. So that's when they start coming out, oh, the police are under fire and uh, 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 and everything like that. No, if you were doing your job properly and no abusing your authority of power over individuals, then you wouldn't be bothered about these videos and that well, being taken. The, the, the community will support good policing. That's just a fact. They will. Exactly. Bad policing, and bad policing needs to be called out when, when it happens. I'm sorry, it does. Yeah. Yeah, and I get I completely agree with you about um there having to be a a, a line of protection for police oh, officers absolutely. no matter what country that you live in, whether it's the UK or anything like that. But the problem I have is that these good officers that do deserve the protection see the bad officers doing the bad things and keep their mouth shut. So in my opinion, they're just as bad as the bad police. You know what I mean? Well, well, because that that brings you know that brings up the you know the other part we've talked about uh, with before is that the good police officers don't really have a safe in most instances they do not have a safe route to report it. They yes. they just don't. And 
you know, yeah. they may want to say something, but if they know if they do, they're in some places they literally are under threat and their family. You know, that it's, it's terrible. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I understand that. Hi, I understand that. But then that's where the the protection needs to come in here. Yeah, you know I what agree. I mean. Know the protection for know the protection for the one who's been caught on camera with her knee on their neck and somebody can't breathe and they die right there on the spot because he's putting pressure and pushing off the car and everything like that, that you've seen every step of the frigging way. You know what I mean? Yeah. And some of them get away with it. I mean, the majority of them get away with it and it's not right and it's not fair. But there needs to be that protection for the good cops that do, as you say, want to come forward because some of them are terrified for their family and their whole district or force can turn against them. And that's where the need, protection needs to be. No for these assholes, you know what I mean? That's right. This is a good one here, Christina, on this PDF. It says, we cannot, however, estimate rates of misconduct in all criminal cases. And even among exonerations, we miss a great deal of official misconduct that remains hidden. Wow. Yep, it said on there that it does not include misconduct by defense attorneys or judges. So, and, you know, we we see that with uh, Ken the Cat Kaczynski, or Lynn the Cat Kaczynski, and Judge Suckowitz, um, you know. So, just to highlight that. Um, so, those are not included in these in these exonerations. Or, or their misconduct study. If we can go to um, page 13. Okay, I'm there. All right. Um, I just thought these stats were pretty interesting. Um, uh, 80% of murder cases with tainted IDs, at least one witness deliberately misidentified the exoneree. Many were forced to do so. Um, all I can say is fire on the 31st. You know, um, Bobby saying that he saw Teresa walking towards Steven's trailer. Uh, you know, or Penny Bernston. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Really good one, Susan. Get it? That is a really good one. Yeah. Or um, for some reason, I'm thinking of Justin Sneed in the Richard Glossop case. Um, yep. Those cops basically told him, even in the Julius Jones case, um, both of the co-defendants were told, if you don't name someone else, you're going to go to death row for this crime. So yep. who? Even if you were who only an idiot or even an idiot would say, I'm going to make up someone so I don't die. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. that's just like you're asking for a, you're asking for for problems when you say if you don't name someone else, you're going to death row. Well, of course. I mean, that's like a fill in the blank scenario. Right. Um. And then I yep. found uh, in all but one sexual assault exonerations, victims or other witnesses were persuaded or tricked into misiding the exonerees by mistake. In one case, the ID was produced by threats. And uh -huh. once again, like Susan said, Penny Bernson uh, all over there. Or even Dennis Vogel writing to the Manitowoc Police Department saying, you know, hey, cops, are you sure Gregory Allen was who you saw? Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to go I'm going to go out about this uh, freaking monster. Mm -hmm. It's the craziest thing. Um and then page 15, if we go to that, okay, um, fabricated official evidence. In 10% of exonerations, officers falsely reported that they examined 
that forensic evidence that proved or failed to disprove that the defendant's guilt saw the defendants commit crimes that did not occur or witnessed confessions by defendants who did not confess. Forensic fraud, the deliberate falsification of forensic evidence to help convict the defendant occurred in 3% of exonerations. Um, so Sherry Colhane sneezing on the DNA sample, anyone? And I just, I don't know, you know, you read that one and she immediately came to mind, but 3% seems really low to me. I don't know why. Maybe I'm jaded. I don't know. I think about, you know, the Joyce Gilchrist and uh, who, who was her boss. There, there was a, or a, there was another one in that lab, too, and I can't think of her name. But yeah. Or it, even it, it, COFED or whatever. Oh, God, yeah, COFED. I mean, that guy, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it's probably untold how many cases that he affected, you know, to, so he could promote his own career. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Definitely Sherry Colhane. It, you know, there was a post I read. I'll just say this right quick. There was a post I read the other day, or actually recently, about the samples that were sent to the FBI. Um, mm -hmm. The, the Q-tip swabs, but they didn't collect those swabs. They took what the crime lab sent them. So she could have sent them anything. She could have sent them whatever, right? Yeah. They didn't, they didn't collect the swabs. Him. Yeah, she could have sent him Stephen Avery's groin swabs thrown away by Froley. And they only tested half of them to, to boot. So mm -hmm. forensic yeah. fraud, I, I just, it, it's all over that case. If you read and understand what, what actually happened. If the FBI had collected those swabs themselves, I couldn't say that, but they didn't. Sherry sent them. No, that. they were just. Yeah, they were testing evidence, and Sherry didn't even collect them. She, or wait, what are we talking? Oh, she might have collected some of them. But yeah, from I'm the thinking, RAV. They're, 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 these are from the RAV, I'm sure. Okay, so it was either her or, or what was his name, Groffy? Gro Groffy, yeah, I think it was her. Yeah. Sent them. yeah. In, a more than, in more than a third of the cases, forensic witnesses reported that the defendant might have been the source of crime scene blood, semen, or fingerprints after forensic tests showed that was impossible. So they know, they know it's not the defendant, but they get on the stand and lie and say it is. Yep. Like, how can you take a scientist at their word if they're willing to lie? Uh, you know, I mean, we're supposed to give these people their testimony more weight than the average Joe, but yet they'll lie just like the average Joe. They are average people. The only difference is they have a piece of paper saying they finished a program. Well, you know, you know, that's that, what that, that's what the Center for Integrity and in Forensic Sciences is all about, which is Dean and Jerry's um, mm -hmm. nonprofit. Yeah, which yeah, by the it, way is tied is tied to our merch. If anybody yep. wants the merch, that's right? Yeah, right. buy yeah. coffee. Buy, go buy a coffee cup. Send these people some money. Get a tumbler. Yeah, but, you know. Yeah, that 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 reminds me of. Um, and I don't, I don't know how many people have, have seen it. I'm not sure how much you looked at it, Christina. But the um, receipts of money that was spent out in the Avery and Dassey cases and come to find out that Eisenberg, by the time January or February of 06, she had gotten almost nine grand extra. Nine thousand. You didn't know that? Huh? Oh, uh, no, yeah. I have see to what, look at that file. See what you missed? See what you mm -hmm. missed? You take you take her. Yeah. They cut her. It's I don't know. It's in there. Yeah. It's, I think one check was for almost four grand. And there was another one that was for, I think, um, three grand. And another one was for 1980 It's almost $9,000 by the time January or February 2006 rolls around. So four or five months later. She's nine grand. Written in yeah. her name. Written in her name. Absolutely. Jesus Christ. Wow. 
Yeah, if that's not paying for testimony. Now, what? And so in January of 06, she hadn't done anything. Well, she had. She's, She's never stalked. been to the crime scene. No, she hadn't. She had done about three hours worth of work, if you look in her notes. Because by January of 06, she still didn't have much of the testing. Like, she, they'd only been, I'll have to go back to confirm, but she she really hadn't done much of anything. No, not really. Uh, she works for the state. The state that's right. pays her salary. That's, what the that's fuck right. is she getting paid this extra money for? I don't exactly. know. That's what I can't figure out. I was hoping to find a, a check written out to Colhane, but uh, I haven't seen anything. I haven't had time to look at all of it. it it's really interesting, though. And it, oh, I'm sorry. Know, I thought you were talking about Colhane. Who are you talking no, about, Jack? Eisenberg. Eisenberg. Oh, Eisenberg. Oh, yeah. Same, same yeah. difference. Yeah. yeah. Well, it is. So it, it's it, crazy. You know, you think about this big pot of money, and if you look at these receipts of where the money went, everybody had their hand in it. I'm not kidding. It's oh, crazy. Oh, yeah. Of course. I have to look at those because I'm trying to get those receipts too. I'm fighting with Eisenberg and her staff right now to get her notes. Like I've been in this email battle with them for almost a year because she's trying to claim her notes are work products. And the hell? I need yeah, they they might be work product if a lawyer. If she hadn't testified in a murder case. That's you know what I mean? But when you testify in a murder case, that's discoverable. So, yeah, we need, and we need, we, so. we need her bench notes. We got Stocky's bench notes. We need hers too. And Cole Haynes. Yeah. All of them. Yep. And her emails. I want her emails to Cracks. I want her emails to Fastbender. I want her emails to Weaver. I want it all. Right. Because um, I want to know how. I'll tell you what I'm looking for specifically. I want to know when the decision was made to drop the the dismemberment because I feel like there was a at the beginning the dismemberment was going to be discussed until it was determined that they weren't going to be able to sell that story because they didn't have a crime scene so then it kind of just faded away and I got a real problem with that um so let's see. Let's go to 15. Oh, wait, it's on the, we're already on there. So fake crimes were fabricated by police in 5% of exonerations. And about 4% police planted evidence at the scene of the crime and claimed to have found it there. Key? Anyone? Key? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, rap, potentially yeah, rap, rap, rap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, rap. Blood, 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 blood. Oh, it, everything thing. Yeah. And um, what goes on and on and on. <laughs> yeah, everything in this case was planted. Um. Oh, the the electronics in the burn barrel that appeared four days later. Yeah. In all but a few cases, they planted illegal drugs. So what that says is they planted more than just drugs to get their guy. Yep. Yep. Um, so it's not just in drug cases that this occurs. Um, DNA. And then if you go to 16, fabricated confessions. Um, I thought this was interesting. And in, in about 2% of exonerations, police made up confessions from exonerates who didn't confess. <laughs> That's good. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So they said, oh, he confessed to me, but the man never confessed or the woman never confessed. Wow. Um, so in several cases, police had them sign documents they did not or could not read, which later turned out to be confessions. In most cases, they lied and said the exonerees made unrecorded oral confessions. As mm -hmm. usual, as usual for false confessions, 
fabricated confessions were more, more likely in Chicago. Weren't we just talking about Chicago mm. than elsewhere? But by only a modest amount, 16 to 11 percent. Uh, let's see. And then Paige is. Did Rhonda get here yet? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure she's okay. up yet. Oh, oh. I, haven't, I haven't seen her. All right. Well, we've made it to. If you go to. If you go to page 24. So this entire document is really interesting, but it's 200 pages long. And as much as we love to talk and listen and learn, it's just too intensive to go for. I kind of um, tried to. Do you, do you have a link to this uh, in the description? I'll, 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 add, I'll add it once we're done. Awesome. Yeah, everything that everything we looked at will be linked um, in the video description once we get done with the live. I'll I'll post it. I'll link everything. I just want to mention in 1959, the Supreme Court held that a prosecutor has a constitutional obligation to correct perjury by a state witness, even if she did not herself offer the false testimony. Prosecutors permitted perjury to go uncorrected in 8% of the exonerations they looked at. In most cases, the perjury was by civilian witnesses. The most common lies were about favorable treatment the witnesses received in pending criminal cases of their own. Wow. It is it is misconduct and punishable as contempt of court for a lawyer to lie in court, whether or not the lawyer is under oath. We know that prosecutors lied in court in 4% of exonerations. The real rate may be higher since we only count cases with clear evidence that prosecutors made statements they knew were false. About half of the lies by prosecutors were made in their closing arguments. A common pattern is to repeat and affirm perjury by a witness that the prosecutor knew but failed to correct was a lie. For example, a lie by a witness who claimed to have no deal with the prosecutor. So I just wanted to make sure, um, because that all occurred in the Stephen and Brendan's case as well. Absolutely. Um, yep. So these are some of the highlights. Uh, it, this is under why do law enforcement officials commit misconduct? And then page 24 discusses um Joyce Gilchrist. Yep. Um, she's on down a little bit. Yeah. She's yeah. And she that... was go ahead. No, I'm just saying she's a bitch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is uh Susan, I'm gonna send you a link to this. Uh what is the uh Bob Macy, isn't that his name? Yeah, yep, yeah. that's that's All bloodthirsty, right. bloodthirsty Bob. And I just, um, I have a feeling he trained her. Yeah, I, she was I, one of the guys. Yeah, Christina, I think so. She went to the pub with them. She um, was in, in the majority of the cases um, that she done. Um, and she trained Elaine Taylor, who was the forensic lab labist, who did Daniel Hope's cause clause case? So you can imagine the dirty tricks Kilchrist got up to. Well, Elaine Taylor got up to the same dirty tricks in Daniel's case. And mm -hmm. one of the cops that was on Daniel's case is was the lab tech's mother in law. Wow. And, and, that, yeah. and none of that, none of that surprises me. Because we've seen that in this case as well. They're all related or they're best friends or they're, you know, they just, it's clearly a 
click, right? It's clearly a click. Um, and it's an us versus them mentality. All right, I sent this to as a bunch of people um, so y'all could look at it. Um, so Joyce Gilchrist was fired as a supervisor in 2001 after 16 years at that lab. By then, she was known to have committed forensic fraud in several cases. That count has grown to dozens of forensic fraud cases, which have included six, six exonerations. So what does that say to y'all? Uh, criminal. She should have been in jail. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> It's not a one-off thing. Um, once you get away with it once, you're going to do it again, and you're going to do it again, and you're going to do it again. Because yeah, there's and because, rush, right? yeah, and because she was getting the pats on the back by the boys in blue, it made it even worse, Christina, because then they could go to her and they, or they could be sitting in the pub and, oh, we need this guy Tim doing he's a... He, he's a he's a bastard, you know what I mean? And he, he do, he's done this and he's done that. And she'd be like, I need one of these guys, just leave it to me. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was as if I'll take care. Of yeah, read that next part. Is the uh, why did Gilchrist pursue a career in forensic fraud? It made her a star. She received a citation from the police department, accommodation from the district attorney, an early promotion, and was named civilian police employee of the year. Yeah. Yep. She was she she got off on the power, the control, the accolades. Um, yep. Probably the fringe benefits, right? Definitely. Um, yep. And so and you know, they're supposed to be quote the good guys, unquote. But when criminals are quote the good guys, unquote, what does that make the criminals? Cuz that's not Bad guys, crim if they're not really criminals, then they're victims of criminals. Well, you see the how absurd this is? It is. I mean, I mean the criminal, and it, this highlights right here what I've said for years. The criminal justice system is only as good as the people running it, period. And, and, and the thing is, um, we're going to discuss this next. This is not a new phenomenon, okay? It's not. No. It has been run by corrupt criminals masquerading as the, quote, good guys for centuries. When you read some of these cases, when um, that link I sent you, the five most heinous wrongful convictions. Yeah, I've got um, it. Yeah, we'll t we'll talk about that in a minute. What they did to these guys and women is absolutely disgusting. Do you know? Oh, let me mention this too while I'm thinking about it. So, when slavery was abolished, they started this system where prisoners and and this was mostly in the South where prisoners could be quote hired out to businesses for a fee. Yeah. Most of these prisoners were people of color and most of these, and they were all treated disgustingly, you know, just, um, just abuse, especially in, in Louisiana. Um, so what they did is they abolished slavery, but then they would lock up these, these black people, black men as criminals for crimes they didn't commit. And then the plantation owners would, quote, hire inmates from the prisons and then bring them back out there and do the same shit they were doing to them when they were slaves. That's why they passed the 13th Amendment. No. No, this was after they abolished slavery. But the 13th Amendment, basically, if you read it, you have to read it. We know, basically, uh, when, once you're incarcerated, you're, you're not really a person anymore. You, so you, you, you really kind of can Slavery is legal. Basically, exactly yeah. what Susan. 
Yeah. They they did that in Virginia. I've, I made a note about that. They, in, I forget what year it was, you were deemed uh, a slave of the state. That was the exact wording by the Supreme Court. If you were convicted of a crime, you no longer have any rights except those base those basic human rights which that's a joke um which is basically to breathe right that's like the only right we, we can't kill you but we can do anything else we want to you um and that was that was uh that was in a case in virginia but it was overturned let me see i saved that but anyway i'm gonna get off topic i i went researching this podcast i found so much evil and just cruelty. Yeah, I think this is that's diabolical. Kind of, it really oh. is. Just the amount of cruelty on humans by other humans really just, it really just, I was really surprised that it was that prevalent. And I shouldn't be surprised after what I've seen in this case and and this stuff with Gregory Allen in Wisconsin, um, the criminal justice system has been in the tank um, maybe ever since it was formed. <laughs> I don't think it ever was, I don't know. It's just bad. Um, so, okay, here we go. Officers Iannato, Palmer, Pecorale, Martin, Visconti, Bishop, and Detective Massanova all participated in the investigation of a fatal shooting in New York in November of 1990. They soon ID'd an innocent suspect and brought him to the scene in handcuffs and wearing a jacket turned inside out to resemble the shooter's jacket, where several witnesses urged each other to ID him. The next day, they put the disheveled suspect in a lineup with well-groomed police cadets, and he was misidentified again. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, uh it's just, and it's just case after case after case like this so that's that um page 26 uh susan you'll find this interesting because it talks about crime labs and um one of the things they talk about at the end of the study is the the need to have independent separate crime labs um but it no says doubt. Yeah, it says crime labs in the U.S. are usually run by local police departments. Experts agree that only independent crime labs can eliminate conflicts of interest and provide reliable technical supervision. So I believe, and I think um, we all do, when a lab tech is testing evidence, there should be no suspect victim it should be a b right and you don't know what a is and you don't know what b is and either they're there or they're not there um, it has it has to be double blind testing otherwise yes. bi bias yep. comes into play and it's assigned yes. a number uh so they can track it and it goes it comes in gets tested and it goes out done yeah, and if and if you can't test evidence and come up with a result without knowing the suspect and the defendant, then to me, that DNA isn't the conclusive proof of guilt it has been touted as. That's if right. You require if you have to know who you're looking for in order to see if they're there, then DNA isn't the end all. It's been it's been made to made represented as being. Right? Well, I mean na okay. names can be names can be involved, but it can't be involved for the lab tech. It can, that, no, that has no. the information has to be deciphered by someone else, not the lab. 
period. Yeah. They get a number for that piece of information. It comes in, yeah. gets tested, boom, here's the result. It goes out. And somebody yeah. else yeah. entirely separate, and they these people can't communicate. It's, it, they had, They, they need that's right that's exactly how it should be the person testing the evidence should then hand off their findings to a person who then enters it into CODIS to determine who it belongs to that's right and if we know that and we're you know just regular Joe blows if we have the sense to to know that's how to prevent wrongful convictions i'm not going to buy cops and and lab techs don't also know that oh it's common absolutely. sense and Ab and there just isn't any in our justice system no and if they don't want to employ those those practices you have to ask why. Why wouldn't they want to guarantee there's no wrongful convictions? Why is it acceptable that you're convicting innocent people? Because it should never be acceptable that an innocent person spends one hour in jail, much less 20 years. It's all about the dollars, Christina. It's mm -hmm. all about the money. It really is. I saw a when I was doing this research, do you know that, do you know how much is spent on average, $4 a day is spent to feed an inmate prison food or jail food? Some yeah. states, it's less than $2. Yep, that doesn't surprise me. They spend I, I... more to guard them that's where most of the budget goes. Salary. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Sure. The warden, the prison the guards, prison guards, the extra staff, electronic um, monitoring. Yeah. Cool. That's where the money goes. It doesn't go into programs to reduce recidivism. It doesn't go into feeding medical care because most states are now billing the inmates family for medical care but if you um, look at how the legislation is written that money has already been allocated to the prisons it's from the taxpayer dollars to take care of them yeah i know that when my brother he got in a lot of trouble when while i was younger because he was three years older than me but he um he went to prison and uh but he uh, after uh i think it was 18 months he he got he got released to a minimum security it was still nearby but it was a minimum security prison and they it was a farm it was a working farm and you had to agree to work those guys ate well because they raised their own food i'm talking about i'm talking about uh dairy uh uh, beef and and and, pole and uh, chickens and pigs and they had uh, they raised all kinds of you know whatever they grew whatever kind of vegetables corn and you know everything so they ate well but they had they had to work for it and and that no used to be it's no any better sorry Christina it's no any better here for um the prisoners with it's two pound. Mm -hmm and two pence the government pays the prison for each prisoner for food uh, which covers the daily prisoner food and beverage requirements two pound and two pence yeah oh my god that's for three yeah. meals yeah that's three meals and that's no <laughs> and, um, and drinks yeah and what and most of the time you don't get a drink the drink is the water fountain you might get some chicory coffee that is like, we, they call it poop water. That's what it looks like. <laughs> um, and as far Sorry as like, laugh, but... yeah, as, as far as having like prison farms, there's still a few of them around, but 
that is a very small percentage of inmates that eat. Oh, I'm sure it is now. I'm sure it is now. That was in Tennessee. You know, that was back in the late 70s. And um, mm. I don't remember how many of that minimum security place housed, but it, it was, I mean, it wasn't as big as the prison, nothing like, but it, it, they were still uh, probably several hundred um, inmates there in the minimum security. Um, I think the latest statistic, I sent you a link. Um, the latest statistic, statistic is there's 1.8 million people incarcerated in America. Um, and oh, what's funny hard. is, what's funny is they, uh, and that might just be in prisons. That might not be jails as well. Um, but it's funny. They're like, uh, yeah, the numbers dipped in 2020. But of course they dipped in 2020 because there was this huge outcry because of COVID. So they did like mass releasings of anyone who was not on a violent felony, anyone who was almost at the end of their sentence. So the numbers dropped for that year, but um, they have steadily increased for you know, since the 80s, they've just gone up and up and up. And I found it interesting. There's like 400 people, I think, in the Mantua County Jail. Um, and there's only like 50,000 people in, in that county. But they have over, over 400 people in their jail. We have... In my county, we have like 200,000 and maybe 250,000 people with the students in the entire county. And we have about 600 people in our jail on average. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, let's see what else we have. Um, if we go to... Page 90, 89, and 90. I have it noted for something. Let's see. Uh, okay, there's page 89. Yep. All right. So at the bottom is permissible. Permissible promises and threats. Some type Lies, of, rather. Yep, yep, exactly. Some type of promises are off limits in interrogations. Police are forbidden to promise specific legal outcomes if the suspect confesses. Dismissal of charges, probation, whatever, because they don't have the legal authority to make good on such promises. Um, and I think when I read that, I thought about Brendan asking if he's going to be back to take his test. Um, police are also forbidden to make some threats, especially threats of violence and threats to take action against children, spouses, and other third parties who are dear to the suspect. Um, a common tactic is to threaten uh, suspects girlfriends or boyfriends with getting DCF involved in their life if they don't huh. say what they want them to say. You see like that or yeah. if they don't do what they want them to mm -hmm. do. Um, you, you actually see that tactic employed on first 48. They'll do it out in the open on cases right now. If y'all. Yeah. You want us to get you, you, before. you want us to get us. Yeah. You want us to get child welfare down here. You better tell mm -hmm. me what I'm. Yeah. And uh, and I just think that's disgusting. The basic test is this. Are the police promising or threatening to do things that they have the power to do? If so, it's OK. Police may make recommendations to prosecutors and judges, so they may mm -hmm. promise or imply that they will do so, even if they have no such intention. 
They may also threaten to arrest a suspect or promise to refrain from making an arrest. Both are within their power. Probably their most common promise is to allow suspects to go home if they confess. Indeed, some exonerees, including Bobby Johnson, were allowed to go home after they confessed. They just didn't get to stay there. Oh. Oh, wow. In March of 1997, 16-year-old Fancy Figueroa was raped by a stranger after she got home from school in Queens, New York. She was taken to a hospital for a kid, but when it was discovered she was pregnant, police concluded that she lied about the sexual assault to cover up the real cause of her pregnancy. Oh, they told her that if she wrote down on a piece of paper that she was lying, they would help her look for her assailant. She complied and was charged with and convicted of filing a false police report. The officers didn't follow up on the assault. They considered the matter closed by Figueroa's admission that she had lied. She was exonerated seven years later when the DNA from her, her sake kit was matched to a serial assailant in a routine search of a DNA database. I that hope she sued the, I hope she sued the hell out of them. No oh, shit. Wow. wow, I missed that last night. That is absolutely disgusting. And a lot of these are sex assault that never occurred to a lot of these exonerations, which of course makes me think of Brendan. Um, yeah. Let's see if we go down to 123. Uh, yep. So Yeah, actually, go go halfway up 122. So these are incentives to testify. Um, I just find this interesting because, you know, there's been a lot of discussion, you know, in the Stevens case. So And this a, also it, will apply to Daniel's case. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. In a fifth of all exonerations... 281 out of the 1,361 cases looked at, the prosecution concealed an incentive to testify on the part of one or more of their witnesses. Sometimes it was a promise, for example, in Bernard Barron's wrongful prosecution for child sex abuse in Massachusetts in 85, a video of an interview with a supposed victim was edited to remove the portion where the child who'd been pressured to accuse Baron asks, where's my prize? You promised me a prize. Wow. Oh, boy. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And see, okay, so if they were editing videos in 85, um, you know, because we've had concerns that they've edited videos here. Um, and I'm sure, you know, in that, wow. In other cases, it was a threat. Adam Miranda, I wonder if that's where the Miranda warning came from, was prosecuted for the murder of Robert Hosey in L.A. in 83. The main prosecution witness was told that unless he testified against Miranda, he himself would be prosecuted for that crime. Wow. Sometimes. No, not the same. Not the same Miranda. Uh, our Miranda no. warning was no. Our Miranda was passed in sixty-eight or sixty-nine. So there's been two Mirandas that have been wrong that have been wrongly prosecuted or fouled up in the justice mm. system, and that's a strange name. I'm yeah, or not? I shouldn't say strange name. It's not a very common name. That's no. what I mean by that. And sometimes, as in LaVon Jones's case, it was both. 
The most common concealed incentive to testify falsely is a deal with the prosecutor to dismiss or reduce pending criminal charges against the witness. The witness might be a co-defendant charged for the same crime as the exoneree, or she may face unrelated charges. Michael oh, yeah, Hashes, give, give him a mutiny. Yeah, well, like Justin Sneed, he escaped the death penalty by saying Richard Glossop put him up to it. Mm-hmm. So did Julius Jones's co-defendant by saying that by his co-defendants and his co-defendant said all I did was drive, right? And by saying that Julius Jones was a shooter, he is now a free man. And that dude in uh, Adnan's case, that's the state you oh, see. Yeah. What's his name? Jo- Justin? Josh? J-, 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 J, I thought J, and a J, J or something? Yeah, it's J. So Michael Hash's 2001 murder trial in Virginia included both types of dishonest witnesses. A co-defendant falsely testified that Hash and a third defendant shot the victim. He had a secret deal with the prosecution that reduced his own charge to second degree murder and his punishment to six years and eight months in prison. In addition, a jailhouse informant falsely testified that Hash confessed to him while in jail. The defense was not told that the informant had an agreement with the prosecutor under which his term in prison was reduced from 15 years to five, or that he had given similar testimony against at least 20 other defendants. Oh, my God. Orville Pro- Jacobs? Anyone? Professional, pro- professional what? Yeah, or, you know, this makes me think of the Randall Matea case, and that guy actually had the nerve or the confidence to have it written down exactly what he wanted to say that Randall Matea confessed to him. And more scarily, he got it. He yeah. got a job, a place to live, cash, and like five felonies reduced. That's, and of course, there's money from several possible sources. After Sean Lawrence was convicted of murder in Amityville, New York in 2015, his appellate lawyer discovered that the prosecution had paid four grand in relocation expenses to a crack addict who testified that he saw Lawrence shoot the victims. God. At Perman Pittman's murder trial in New Jersey in 07, the prosecution hid evidence that the only witness who ID'd Pittman had been paid to do so by the drug dealers who were trying to muscle the murdered victim out of the drug business. <sighs> and at John Thompson's 1985 murder trial in New Orleans, a witness testified that he heard Thompson admit to the killing, but the prosecution concealed a $15,000 reward the witness received for his testimony from the victim's family. Wow. Yeah. Pay to play. That is absolutely disgusting. Um, and then, so, and then go, if we go down a little bit further, inconsistent statements, we have... Um, and I, you know, I was just thinking, um, comparing all of these cases, it's like every single one of them apply to Stephen and Brendan's case, probably Daniel Holt's cause case. Um, you know, it's when it's a completely fabricated case, like in Daniel's case and, and the Teresa Halbach case. Um, I guess they have to pull from every idea to get it to stick, right? Oh, to make it work, yeah, to build their story, their saga, absolutely. Yeah. So, 
In 14% of the prosecutions of exonerated defendants, the authorities concealed statements by prosecution witnesses that contradicted their testimony at trial. Sandra Craig did not know that the six-year-old girl who accused her of child sex abuse in Maryland in 1987 had also ID'd numerous other people as her abusers and had mistaken some else for Craig. The prosecutor who had attended some of the interviews with the girl did know about these statements and hid them. James Haley was convicted of murder in Boston in 1972 after the victim's girlfriend and the victim's roommate both testified that they had seen Haley, the roommate's estranged husband, in the neighborhood around the time of the crime. The victim's girlfriend also testified that she saw Haley commit the murder. Haley was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. 34 years later, wow, a public records request by Haley revealed that the prosecution had concealed reports that both women initially told police they hadn't seen Haley in over a month. Oh my God, her entire, half her life is gone. Yeah, that's awful. From an criminal, like hiding criminal records and histories of dishonesty, and I think we see that in Stephen and Brendan's case with Chuck and Earl. Still doing it. There's still records we can't. Yeah. Um, so this is 125. And if we go to 173, that's Joyce. Okay, I'm there, 170. Let's see, I'm trying to get you. So if you go to the bottom, it'll say Joyce Gilchrist. Alice, Rewarding fraud. Rewarding fraud. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to read the highlights of this one? Yeah, I could do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Joyce Gilchrist, Rewarding Fraud. On May 8th, 1985, a woman was assaulted in her apartment complex in Oklahoma City. Jeffrey Pierce, who worked at the complex as a landscaper, was taken by police to the victim. She said he was not the assailant. In 1986, police created a photographic lineup with a picture of Pierce wearing a tan t shirt, an element of the victim's initial description of her attacker and the victim identified him. Pierce was arrested, convicted of assault and related crimes and sentenced to 65 years in prison. He was exonerated by DNA testing 15 years later in 2001. Pierce's conviction depended heavily on the testimony of Joyce Gilchrist, a forensic chemist at Oklahoma City Police Department. Gilchrist testified that 33 scalp and pubic hair samples from the crime scene were microscopically consistent with hairs taken from Mr. Pierce's body. In other words, she testified that the hairs could have come from Mr. Pierce. Such testimony is scientifically meaningless because there are no systemic data on the frequency of various microscopic characteristics in human hair. Even if the two hair samples do in fact share similar characteristics, in this case, the basic factual premises was false. A re-examination by the FBI in 2001 concluded that none of the hairs taken from Pierce's body exhibited the same microscopic characteristics as those found at the crime scene. In other words, Gilchrist concealed the fact that the hairs found at the crime scene could not have come from Pierce's body. In addition, Gilchrist violated a court order to deliver the hair samples 
in a timely manner for review by Pearcey's own expert. And most importantly, Gilchrist concealed her own findings that Pierce could not have been the assailant because his blood contained an enzyme that was absent from the semen found in the victim. This was hardly the only case in which Gilchrist committed forensic fraud. In 2001, FBI review found that at least five of the cases involved contrived and, uh, and erroneous statements by Gilchrist. And in the case of Alfred Brian Mitchell, a federal judge found that Gilchrist knew that testing by the FBI revealed that Mitchell's DNA was not present on the samples of semen taken from the victim but lied and testified, quote, the DNA analysis performed by the FBI was inconclusive, unquote. A federal court of appeals concluded on review that, quote, Miss Gilchrist thus provided the jury with evidence implicating Mitchell in the sexual assault of the victim, which she knew was rendered false and misleading by evidence that she withheld from the defence, unquote. Ultimately, hundreds of Gilchrist cases were reviewed. Six defendants she testified against have been exonerated, including two who were sentenced to death, and others are still disputed. And one of those death row, uh, uh, and one of those death row exonerees, Gilchrist, erroneously concluded that the real killer could not have been involved because he had the wrong blood type. And in a assault murder in Beatrice, Nebraska, in 1985, an initial suspect, the real killer, moved to Oklahoma City shortly after the crime, where Gilchrist obtained a blood sample and reported the wrong blood type. As a result, he was falsely cleared. That led to four-year investigation that produced false convictions of six innocent defendants who were ultimately exonerated in 2008 and 2009 after DNA evidence proved the crime was committed by the suspect Gilchrist had cleared in 1985. Why did Gilchrist embark on this career of systemic fraud and at least occasionally incompetence? We can only guess at our motivation but the effects was uh, unambiguous. She became a star. After Pierce was convicted in 1986, Gilchrist received an honorary citation from the Oklahoma City Police and a commendation from the district attorney for her, quote, skillful work in the careful analysis of forensic evidence, unquote. In, the 19, in 1990, she was promoted to supervisor. Years earlier than usual, in 1995, she was named Oklahoma City Department Civilian Police Employee of the Year. Gilchrist's work made her popular with police officers. She became known to them as Black Magic because she was able to get results that no other chemist could. When homicide detectives gave Gilchrist hair samples from a suspect, they would often let her know that this was the person that they wanted to arrest. Some time later claimed, some later claimed that they, quote, didn't believe Gilchrist was doing proper lab work, but her results were too good, unquote. But that didn't stop them from using those results in court. Gilchrist was also a forceful and effective witness. And prosecution, prosecutors came to rely on her to win difficult jury trials. In some cases, they committed misconduct themselves in presenting her evidence. Alfred Bryan Mitchell's trial was a striking case as a federal court described in 2001. Compounding Gilgris and proper conduct was that of the prosecutor, whom the district court found had laboured extensively at trial to obscure the true DNA test results which cleared Mitchell of assault and to highlight Gilchrist's misleading test results. 
What a bitch, man. What an utter bitch. Gilchrist became a particular favourite of Oklahoma County District Attorney Bob Macy. In February 2001, Gilchrist, who was being investigated by the police department, was placed on administrative leave. In June 2001, Macy resigned unexpectedly, saying he wanted to spend more time with his family. Three months later, Gilchrist was fired. There had been warnings for years. Defence attorneys had complained about Gilchrist. John Wilson, chief chemist at the Kansas City Police Crime Lab, testified for the defence in several cases that Gilchrist worked on. And then in 1987, he filed a complaint against her with the Southern Association of Forensic Scientists. In 2001, after he claims, after his claims were confirmed by the FBI, Wilson said. I think you have to look at the prosecutor's office. They have to understand what's been going on. They have to see all the flags that have been waved. The judges are no different. It's not just the police. It's not just the prosecutors. It's everyone in the entire system. But as long as the engine was humming along, nobody wanted to look under the hood. And I mean, that, that, that's true. It's, it's disgusting. It is. That case, it that really case is. you were talking about up, uh, up a paid about the Beatrice Six. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a frag book that uh, Susan and I have listened to a good, a good deal. Of. We need to finish it, but uh, I, I thought that was the one y'all were talking about where yeah. um, there was a ring. Uh, if I remember right. No, that's a, that. Now that that's a that's a different case. That's wow, a different case. So no, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's another frag book as well. I uh, I don't know why this made me think of the Richard Swearingen case in Texas. Um, Frank Powell clued me in on this case. This man was executed. We're going to do a podcast on this case because it's absolutely horrific. He was executed for the murder of a college student by the name of Melissa Trotter, I believe. Now, he was in jail when her body was found they claimed um that he had hid the body before he got arrested well then his um appellate attorneys got some forensic entomologists and stuff to do their work and they said there's no way he the woman was still alive when swearing jim was arrested for his driving uh like for driving at the do you uh um, yeah, or driving on suspended, something like that. So then they said, this is this is what they came up with. They said, well, that's because Swearingen killed her and then put her in a freezer. And then while he was in jail, he convinced someone to take the body frozen and put it in the woods to thaw out, which would skew the time of death. Oh, I remember you telling me about this case. Yeah. Yeah. So then there's some kind of test that can be done on the wax in the ear canal that can tell whether a body has been frozen or not. And yeah. It's, yeah. It's it'll cr crystal it crystallize. Yeah. And so they did that test. And of course, her body wasn't frozen. So then they, uh, anyway, they killed them. They killed him. Um, and he didn't kill her. And I just, you know, I don't understand how you can value him, human life so little that you would rather make these clearly ridiculous arguments for guilt instead of just admitting you screwed up. Like, how can you sleep at night knowing you have killed people? Because you were too prideful to they have they have no empathy they they have no compassion they have that, that's turned off it's something broken in their brain that's my opinion. yeah but and I feel like I mean it's clear it's becoming more and more clear it's not just Wisconsin oh I mean, no that's... twenty states just in this just in this um and and I think. 
you know, what Alice said is right. It's systemic. It It's pervasive. Um, and, you know, I, uh, um, if we scroll down to, I think it's 188. Let's see. Yeah. It's. Yeah, down at the bottom where it says local leadership and local culture. Yeah. The most significant features of the American system of criminal justice, if you can call it that, are fragmentation and local control. We have 50 states plus the District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, several territories and the federal government each with its own set of penal and procedural laws and its own court system. More than 90% of criminal cases are filed in the state courts, but in almost all states, those courts are county rather than state institutions. And there are 3,142 counties or equivalent geographical units in the 50 states. As of 2007, there were 2,330 independent prosecutorial offices that handled state law felony cases, mostly one per county. Policing is even more fragmented. There are about 18,000 separate police forces in the U.S., including more than 12,000 local police departments. With rare exceptions, these thousands of agencies are independent of each other and subject to local political control. Most state court judges and prosecutors are directly elected in county elections. Most sheriffs and some local police chiefs are also directly elected. The rest are appointed by elected county and municipal officials. The institutions of national government Congress, the Supreme Court, the President, the DOJ play important roles in the administration of criminal justice across the country. State governments, legislators, governors, attorney generals, state appellate courts are more important within their jurisdictions. But local crime labs, police departments, and prosecutorial offices investigate and prosecute the overwhelming majority of crimes and for the most part, set the working policies for doing so. Any significant reforms depend on the leadership of those who administer these local agencies. Those leaders, in turn, are constrained by the institutions they run. A practice that's been followed for years may be embedded in the institutional culture, and as management professionals like to say, Culture eats strategy for breakfast. That doesn't mean reform is impossible. We've seen it happen, but it can be difficult. The organizational culture itself may have to be changed, which is not a simple process. So. Yep, I totally agree. Um, and I thought Alice would find this interesting. There's a uh, quote, it says, however, as a British court explained in 1993, forensic scientists employed by the government may come to see their function as helping the police rather than providing accurate and complete scientific information. The temptation yeah. to lie and cheat in order to convict a defendant is hardly limited to forensic analysts. Yep. So... It, it's pervasive around the world. Um, and uh, I I mean, I, you know, you don't want to think it can't be fixed, right? We want to, we, we want to remain hopeful that there is a solution. I mean, well, of course we do, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, what that's is there about the 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 forensics. That's completely true, because when it comes to um, 
Blake Mitchell and Jody Jones case, the crime lab only looked for and noted down samples that matched look. Even though there was five different males DNA on and around Jody's body at the time, they all the, the police told them all we want is Luke Mitchell's DNA. So that was all they looked for. Mm -hmm. And I think they just I think they put inconclusive or something like that to the other ones that was there. So if the police had said to them, you know, I want any and all DNA samples, no just Luke Mitchell's DNA, any sample that you can find, I want it discovered right now. They would have done that. Yeah. So it's exactly them thinking that they are working for the police. So the police can go in and say to them, right, I just want you to find I just want you to look for such and such as DNA. And that's what they'll do. They'll just look for such and such as DNA and they will mark down um you know, that things were inconclusive or them labeled them wrong or stuff like that, like they did in Luke's case. So that's completely correct about how, that's why I think, um, like we've said before, any forensics, especially Manitowoc, it should have been sent to an independent um, forensics place, you know, out yeah. with the state, out with the county, you know what I mean? It should have been sent to completely different. Because of Stephen's case in 85 and everything like that, is where the um, the samples in that went for that crime was was constant lab. It shouldn't have went there when they tried to get them in two thousand and five. You know, it should have went somewhere else, and then maybe Stephen wouldn't be sitting where he is if it was if it was like that. Yeah, um, I think like Susan has mentioned. Um, the independent forensic labs are a great idea and another thing mentioned in this report is um, several of these cities have enacted conviction integrity units what i find interesting is that chicago and oklahoma city even though they have multiple um incidences where um, it's been clear that there are multiple cases tainted by one or more officer or forensic analysis. Neither of those cities have chosen to do so. And I think that says a lot about what they're afraid they're going to find. Um, and it says a lot about wh um, what their true motivation is because it's not justice. Because I think that if I worked in a department where it was discovered that a Joyce Gilchrist or a Ronald Watts had been employed, the first thing I would want to do is make sure any person they had wrongfully convicted would have their case reexamined. Oh, I'd be horrified. Yeah. Um, and then um, if you go to the bottom of 208, I thought this was interesting. Um because we've discussed this before about this maybe being one of the ways Stephen can get out. In addition, since 1994, the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department has had the authority to file civil complaints against police forces that exhibit a pattern or practice of conduct by law enforcement officers that violates the Constitution. As of the beginning of 2017, 40 such cases had produced agreements requiring state and local police departments to change their practices. And that's just scratching the surface. That's right. Um, and, you know, if we could compile, a, uh, you know, if we could compile several cases that Manitowoc have uh, acted unethically and um, maybe it could be an avenue for Stephen and Brendan. 
Um, I I don't I don't know. Um, well, we've been at it for a little while now. Um, uh, yeah, we have been going for two hours and nine minutes. Did you, yeah. did you want to look at the? Did you want to look at those um, four heinous cases? Yeah, let's take a look at that because it's they deserve to be discussed. People need to know um, what was done to them. Let's see if I I have a link somewhere. Yeah, there it is. Um, so these are it's it's odd because it's. It's titled Four Heinous Wrongful Convictions in American History. But I think there's five cases. Um, so the first one occurred in 1872. And it's the case of William Jackson Marion. Marion and his friend John Cameron were on their way to Kansas to search for work on the railroad. They stopped for the night at Marion's mother-in-law's house in Nebraska. Cameron disappeared and Marion was suspected of killing him. A body that was assumed to be Cameron's was found a year later in a riverbed near where Marion and Cameron had been staying. Convicted of murder and sentenced to death, the case was appealed with the Nebraska Supreme Court ordering a new trial. However, Marin was again convicted and sentenced to death, and he was hanged on March 25th, 1887. Four years later, John Cameron was, a, was found alive. He had traveled to Mexico to avoid marrying a woman who claimed that he was her child's father. He was pardoned, Marion was pardoned by the state of Nebraska on the 100th anniversary of his death. Wow. That's, that's it's tragic. It's absolutely tragic. And, you know, there are people in Therese, in this case, there are people who, you know, wrongly or rightly still think that um, that could very well be the case here. You know, that Teresa Halbach could be alive somewhere. And even though I don't personally agree with that, I understand how they think that because the forensic evidence in this case is a joke. Yeah. And the Scottsboro Boys in 1931 on um, one of the most infamous cases of wrongful convictions and one that would help spark the civil rights movement was the case of the Scottsboro Boys. In 1931, nine black teenagers were arrested after a fight broke out on a train in Alabama. Two white women on the train then accused the boys of assaulting them. A serious accusation that, especially when used against a black man during the Jim Crow era, could easily result in his death. Later that year, an all-white and all-male jury decided that all of the boys except the youngest should receive the death penalty. Wow, there wasn't even a murder. Um, the case went through a series of appeals. The International Labor Defense of the American Communist Party took cha charge of defending the boys and launched a national movement to free them, drawing widespread support across America. The case led to two important Supreme Court rulings, the first being in the case of Powell v. Alabama, where the court ruled that the Scottsboro boys had been denied right to counsel violating their 14th Amendment right while they didn't even have an attorney. However, when the case went back through the Alabama courts, even though one of the women rescinded her allegation, they were still sentenced to death. In 1935, the Supreme Court once again overturned the verdict in Norris v. Alabama, which stated that the trials had been unfair because there were no black men on the jury. This case would eventually help lead to the integration of juries. After a number of subsequent trials, the, the sexual assault charges were dropped against four of the boys and they were released. 
As for the other five, they were given significant prison sentences. Four were eventually released on parole and pardons were eventually granted. And then we know about the Central Park Five and then the case of Leon Brown and Henry McCollum. They were both black and intellectually disabled, so they never had a chance. They were convicted of the assault and murder of an 11 year old girl in Red Springs, North Carolina. At the time, McCollum was 19, Brown was 15. A local high schooler accused the half brothers of the crime due to a rumor circling around town. Police coerced confessions out of both boys who weren't even able to read the confession documents officers wrote up for them and had them sign. The next year, they were given the death penalty. A few years later, in 91, Brown's sentence was reduced to life in prison. However, McCollum's previous confession was used against him, and he was again given the death penalty, even though both men maintained their innocence. It wasn't until 2015, wow, when DNA evidence proved that the young girl was actually murdered by a convicted killer that Brown and McCollum were finally released. They proceeded to sue law enforcement in the town of Red Springs, and in a federal case in 2021, they were awarded a total of $75 million in compensation. That's crazy. Insane. Yeah. I mean, like, let's just, if, if you had to put a number, if you were on a jury, if Stephen and Brendan were released and they sued, if you had to put a number on what you would award them, what would you give them, Alice? Oh, God, that's a hard one, Christina, because... Poor Stephen's been through it, been through it twice, mm -hmm. and Brendan's been through it once. You know, um, I don't do know if I could actually put a price on it. Um, what, do think, what do you think the minimum should be? Seventy million. Okay, Susan. Um, God, it is hard to put a number on that um, minimum. I would say, you know, a hundred million uh, for Stephen, especially being through twice. Uh, mm -hmm. And Brendan, yeah, uh, you know, I give him as much as possible. Yeah. Um, but I just wanted to say also that <clears throat> that list of the five worst, uh, I'm, hopefully someday Stephen will be number one on that list. Yes, I agree. They by going through it twice. Yeah. I think intentionally framed twice, too, at that. It wasn't no accident either time. You know, it was deliberate and intentional. Yeah. And that's what makes it yeah. so, so evil is and so cruel is they knowingly, knowingly did this to him. Knowingly. Yeah. What about you, Jax? You got a number? Hundred million each. Yeah. Well, I think I think that's a good start. I think if the uh, I think um the guy who bought this phone system who now controls all pretty much every uh prison and jail phone call in the U.S. I think he paid six billion to acquire that. Um, I think uh, a billion. For them you know just as a stop putting innocent people in jail or we're going to make you pay shock value it's got to be something really it's got it's got to be enough that it's painful that, that that they will take action that it wouldn't happen again it has to hurt or yeah, they'll do it, it again has it has to and if they're making billions of dollars off of innocent people, they can afford to pay billions of dollars when they're caught doing it. Yeah, but yeah, there, there, there should be some sort of clause that they have to pay 
any lawsuits or anything like that that, that gets brought forward on appeals. They lose their their job, they lose their retirement, they lose their bonuses. They need to take everything away for these prosecutors, just like they take away somebody's life. You know, it has, to, I mean, it has, it has to it has to hurt. It has to be painful. Yeah. Or they'll do you it exactly. Be, you know what would be nice for and every And they should be year, prosecuted. Yeah, for yeah. every year, for every year a person has spent in prison wrongfully, the person who helped do it to him, if they were a prosecutor or a police officer or a lab analyst, they should have to do a day in jail for every year. Because I'm going to tell you right now, going to jail sucks. All right? And you do you do a week in jail with no no makeup, no privacy, no no you know amenities. Um these little TV shows on going to jail, they try and make it look as glamorous as possible. It's yeah, it ain't gla- it it ain't glamorous at all. No, it's not. It stinks, it's loud, it's cold in the winter, it's hot in the summer. Um they're, the clothes are itchy. The food is terrible. You don't get no soda. You don't get no coffee. Um, if you don't have money, you're not getting no chips or noodles or anything. Um, it's uh, and I think if you had if if a process if Ken Kratz had to do a month in jail, and he could only get out if he confessed to every case he had set up, he'd be screaming. <laughs> Telling the truth after two days. Um, so I guess we're going to wrap it up. Who's up next? Today's Wednesday. Um, today's Wednesday. So probably um, Becca on Friday. I don't, Becca. I don't, yeah, I don't think that Rhonda has anything and she's got computer issues anyway for um, her channel. So uh, it'll be Becca and then we'll be on. Reading with the crew on Saturday. We got a new chapter. And then Sunday, we're going to continue what we started talking about this past Sunday. And that's with uh, Jody. We got some more stuff to talk about there. Well, I, uh, I'm so grateful we finally got this podcast back on the, on the book. Me too, and- Christina. Thank you. Congratulations. I enjoyed, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed uh, having everyone, and thank you, everyone in the chat, for coming. Um, and uh, if uh, anyone has any ideas for some topics um, to talk about, I think uh, I think we have to. We have to keep expanding what we know so that we can better figure out a way to be effective in in uh, fighting this, right? And that was my thought with this. Um, and uh, I just want to thank everyone on the panel, everyone on the chat. And uh, yeah, I look forward to the reading with the crew. That's actually, um, I've, I've enjoyed that. I, I said something on the last episode i read that book a few years ago but i feel like every time i reread anything to do with this case i notice something new of course um, we're, we're, we're more intelligent about what actually happened so we, it, it makes more sense now or we see it in a better light absolutely yeah um so and I, it's you know it's the more maybe that's why it takes so long for these cases to get overturned because it takes that long for the attorneys to actually figure out not only what happened but how they got it across and then come up with an, a compelling argument that will work so um, everybody say a little prayer that the supreme court does the right thing for rodney reed absolutely oh, is it oh what's going on there i didn't know about that they're hearing his case. Um, Are they? Mm-hmm. 
He sued the state in order uh, to get the DNA tested on the belt that strangled uh, this girl. And uh, of course, the state, you know, went went to appeals court, and they 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 claimed prosecutorial, or they claimed um, procedural bar. The state did because he only had so much time to um, file. Yeah. Uh, and they're saying that when they decided on a certain date that against it well he appealed that and so he waited until the appeal was completed but they say no 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 you it it starts from that time period starts from the day that you know uh, you you uh, know about it or whatever yeah that the state denied you Mm -hmm. the appeal doesn't count well you know that's total bullshit well of course it's bullshit yeah. So, but he did file within the time period after, you know, the appeal was over with. So, that's what which, they're looking at right now. Which, so which procedurally, surely, yeah, procedurally, that sounds like what he should have done. Exactly. Yeah. And the state is trying to just, you know, this fucking procedural bar bullshit. So it hopefully really they'll do the right thing and and let him test that the DNA. My God, the guy's on death row for fuck's sake. Yeah, Absolutely. he's claimed it's, his innocence from day one. Um, there is some DNA testing to be done on the belt that strangled this girl, and you know the state said no, sorry, you, you know you didn't file in time. If uh, there's an if there's an iota of a chance that an innocent person is going to be executed, and there's DNA DNA evidence that could exonerate him, because if it's not his DNA on the belt, and it's say her ex husband's, exactly, who's also convicted of sexual assault. I who is a that, cop? He was a cop. Was, yep, and um, it was her. His truck she was found in, I believe. Um, I think that uh, we have an obligation to test that evidence. And yeah, how can you how can you not test it? Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I just want to say those those limitations put on prisoners are part of the PLRA, which was passed at the same time as EDPA in 1996. And it was part of uh, uh, Hangman Bob's uh, handiwork Macy. that enacted Macy. Bob Macy. That, that yeah. shit needs to be overturned. It really does. The Prison Litigation Both Relief of them. Act. Yeah. And, and, and EDPA. Yeah. And EDPA. And we're going to do a show on the PLRA, too, because um, it doesn't get spoke about as much as EDPA, but it really hamstrings prisoners trying to get relief once they're convicted it puts time limits on everything it makes them have to first they have to uh appeal to the warden um like they you know it's just ridiculous it's absolutely ridiculous because most of these prisoners have no money um limited access to the law library they don't even have the records to mount a defense um, and, you know, you're going from conviction attorneys to post-conviction attorneys. So you have that time constraint. Um, and I think if they've set it at like a year, you know, and a year in pr- when you're in prison is not enough time to do these things. It's just not. No. Hell no. no. And, and has Bill Clinton, the one who put the thing into bloody law, he's came out and yep. said, now it was the most, worst mistake he ever did when he was president. It was like, well, well, surely somebody can do something about it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, funny he says that now. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was definitely a bipartisan bill. Oh, yeah. 
and they and they yep. use fear fear mongering it's their favorite tactic. oh right? oh absolutely absolutely um and also favor shit you know yeah you, exactly. you sign this i'll sign that or we'll do this if you do this yeah trading votes yeah and uh and then people that suffer are those who have who are suffering it's the ones who always suffer you know because um if you're wealthy you don't have any issues but if you can't afford proper counsel um then you're in trouble and you know that's the way it's always been so anyway thanks everyone for coming um and uh i'm so glad that this this turned out the way it did and i hope everyone enjoyed it excellent christina thank you mm -hmm. thanks susan thank good you, to alice. have you back christina yeah thank you alice thank you jacks you betcha and with that this has been a file play for